so much for being here. Uh, my name is Alex. Uh, this program, there we go. This program is part of our Sounds of the Tenderloin live music series, a uh, program series that began uh, in 2022, uh, kind of in the midst of the pandemic recovery or learning to live with the pandemic or whatever it is we're doing, and uh, was initially funded by Hardly Strictly Bluegrass. Uh, when they didn't have their in-person festival, they dispersed funds to various industry folks and musicians and venues and stuff around uh, the city, and then also uh, funded some programming here. Uh, 2022 was kind of a crazy year also, but uh, the program was a success and was funded for a second season, so to speak, by the uh, specified general fund for the museum grant program of the California Cultural and Historical Endowment. Uh, thank you so much for supporting Sounds of the Tenderloin. Um, and uh, yeah, this program is super exciting for a lot of reasons. Um, first and foremost, to uh, feature a great citizen of the Tenderloin, uh, Josh, founder of uh, Josh Chion, founder of Dark Entries Records, uh, independent record label based here in the neighborhood and uh, worthy of lots of applause uh, for uh, releasing independent artists' music, uh, keeping a brick and mortar shop open on a, the kind of one of the central retail corridors of the Tenderloin over on Larkin Street. If you haven't visited his shop, you should over on uh, Geary and Larkin, but uh, also for preserving uh, the music and legacy and kind of enriching that legacy too of the musician Patrick Cowley, uh, who we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, Josh is going to interview one of Cowley's uh, early collaborators, uh, Maurice Tanney, uh, and uh, they are going to uh, yeah discuss his his uh, his music, his life, and also kind of the discovery of a lot of the music that the record label has uh, has issued and. Uh, you know, Cowley didn't necessarily like live in the Tenderloin, I don't believe, at any point, but uh, several of his kind of key collaborators did. He, of course, had a studio over uh, just south of Mission Street, just south, you know, just over the border of the neighborhood. And, of course, his music is uh, really on all levels uh, uh, very uh, emblematic of the impact that, you know, queer nightlife had on pop music and mainstream culture. I mean, some of the collaborations with Sylvester are uh, completely immortal tracks that everyone uh, instantly knows and recognizes and are played, you know, every night in bars here in the neighborhood and throughout the city and all over the world. So it's uh, 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 cool to, to hear some of this origin story. Um, without further ado, I'm going to invite Josh and Maurice uh, up to the stage and let's give them a round of applause. First off, thank you everyone for coming out tonight. And I want to thank Steve Fabus. <laughs> who you've been listening to uh, since 5.30 and he'll continue DJing after we're done talking. Uh, Steve has lived in the neighborhood since 1999. And uh, he has been in the city since the mid 70s DJing and was a friend of Patrick's, um, played, uh, the end up for Patrick Kelly's party with the Patrick Kelly singers. Um, and they, yeah, if you read uh, Patrick Kelly's journal, there's uh, another Steve connection in there too. Um, <laughs> so, and well, that kind of yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You can ask you about that. Um, and Maurice Tanny, um, so lucky to have met Maurice um, back in 2009. Uh, and uh, Maurice and Patrick shared a studio together just one block or a few blocks past Mission on a Minna and other studios before that, which we'll get into. And uh, Maurice still plays music all over the Bay. and. Uh, I guess let's just get into it. <laughs> okay, so um, 
Patrick Kelly moved uh, to San Francisco from Buffalo in 1971. He was 21 years old. Uh, he was living in like kind of like a commune-esque house with like, you know, six other people, uh, kind of adjacent to the Cockettes. Uh, and just kind of getting into the whole, you know, uh, performance um, scene here and uh, quickly made friends with musicians. He was a drummer back in Buffalo and had come to the city and enrolled uh, at CCSF, which is where he met Maurice. And uh, I guess we can talk about how you met Patrick and the early days. Sure, uh, I met Patrick when um, <clears throat> I was a music major, and uh, and we were one of the classes that uh, uh, as a music major, uh, I guess it was required at the time, was electronic music, and uh, electronic music was a uh, was pretty esoteric uh, sort of thing at the time. The uh, and Patrick was uh, electronic music was uh, basically synthesizers and tape machines in electronic music in uh, in nineteen. 72 or 73 uh, consisted of two basic disciplines. One was uh, how to operate an electronic music synthesizer, and the other was uh, how to uh, splice tape, because the synthesizers themselves uh, weren't really, uh, uh, they were pretty primitive uh, at the time. And so uh, the method for making music with uh, synthesizers generally consisted of uh, making small noises blips and squeaks, uh, we call them, and, uh, and then you record that onto tape, and then you take that blip, cut it out, and assemble it onto a master tape, and then you come up with this sequence of, uh, of tapes. And this is kind of how uh, electronic music, like Morton Subotnik stuff, or uh, the, the avant-garde music of the time was, was created. And so uh, Patrick was, um, I, I forgot the actual title of uh, what it was, but there's a synthesizer lab at uh, at City College, and there was a, which basically consisted of one large room and then a few smaller kind of telephone booth sized rooms that uh, contained small synthesizers uh, and them and uh, a tape deck, and then a larger room with a larger modular synthesizer setup and uh, and a larger uh, uh, four track Ampex tape recorder, uh, quite, a, quite a large beast at the time. And Patrick was the student, uh, I, for, I forgot the actual term before, but uh, rather than have a, a teacher there uh, running the lab, they would have a student assigned to uh, run the lab, usually a second year student who had some idea of what, was, uh, uh, what this equipment was about. So that, that Patrick was that guy. And he had the, uh, uh, and so he had the keys to the a lab, and uh, at the uh, at whatever the closing time was, which was on 7:30 or 8 o'clock, uh, the last student would leave. Patrick had the keys, and we could we could stay there all night. We had access to this equipment that was uh, was extremely expensive stuff that we none of us could have afforded. Uh, the, the synthesizer was uh, a few thousand dollars worth of modular gear, and the tape machine itself was a four-track Ampex, which at the time, those machines were about $1,000 a track, and so that was a $4,000 tape machine to be able to play with. And uh, so uh, that's when I met Patrick, and, and we, uh, it, we worked the, the first year of our working uh, was, was there at City College until we uh, met Art Adcock. And Art had a little bit of money and, uh, and bought himself uh, a, a new state-of-the-art synthesizer and, uh, and a small, uh, tape machine that changed the course of music production, really, uh, the TAC-3340. This was a, whereas that four-track machine that I was talking about in the lab was about the size of a, a small refrigerator, or a, you know, at least a washing machine, it was about that big. Uh, this was a machine that was about a third of the price and about the size of a large, normal consumer tape deck. And it brought uh, what I would consider the kind of the democratization of the recording process to uh, to just about everybody, which you know has extended all the way to today. That uh, 
going from uh, four track machines and eight track machines and cassette machines that could record uh, eight tracks at a time all the way into uh, uh, Pro Tools and the other computer based machines to the point where you can now record your album on your smartphone. Uh, and th this was the beginning of that journey, uh, the early 70s, when, because before that time, the recording process was such that uh, it was something that was done in a professional studio. You know, a very expensive, multi-million dollar facility run by you know, guys in lab coats, and the musicians would stay in you know the big room where you'd uh, you'd play the instruments, and then they'd play it back to you over the speakers. And maybe you got to go up to the control room and look at the knobs and faders up there. But uh, but yeah, it was a, a process that you weren't really a part of. So Patrick was right at the beginning of this. It was all still uh, unformed. Uh, all the, uh, the the equipment was in flux, and uh, and the music was in flux. We, we were uh, synthesizers were you didn't see synthesizers out uh, in live concerts at the time because they were so unstable still. The, uh, the and when I say unstable, the the synthesizers that we started working with, uh, that Patrick started with, uh, was a it was called a Putney an EMS something or other, uh, and it was a uh, it was a small machine that had all the, the uh, uh, kind of a sampler of the basic components of a large university style uh, Buchla or Moog synthesizer modular setup. But this was a, a small thing and it had you know, two, maybe three oscillators in it and uh, a low frequency oscillator, a voltage controllable filter, a couple of uh, uh, voltage controllable amplifiers. The basic components of a synthesizer that you could uh, you know, work with in this small thing, but it was so unstable that, uh, well, as a matter of fact, it didn't come with a keyboard. It was, uh, it had a button on it, and you would uh, you'd set up these sounds, the blip or the squeak I was talking about, and you'd press a button, it would make the blip or the squeak, and you'd record it. I had a joystick too, too. Uh, for, uh, and it had a lot of knobs on it, but they, uh, but it, it was, so unstable you couldn't, when you did hook up a keyboard to it, you had to tune the keyboard and you had to secondarily tune the keyboard so that the scale from C to C was actually C to C. And to make matters uh, more uh, uh, frustrating was that as the machine warmed up, this, the, the tuning would slip. And so it was only good for, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, five minutes. So it wasn't something that you could really take on stage with you. This was all uh, music that was made for, uh, and maybe in universities, and, and you just kind of, if you were gonna use the keyboard, you got it to work, hopefully you recorded it, and then you went back to tuning it again. So it wasn't something that you were gonna use uh, live a lot. And, uh, well, I'm gonna play a piece of music that was recorded live uh, with Maurice and Patrick in 1973 at CCSF that never been heard before, I just <laughs> dug it up. Uh, so I guess also the backstory with how I met Maurice is in 2007, um, Honey Sound System, which was a DJ collective that I used to be part of, was contacted by John Hedges, who was the uh, last owner of Megatone Records, and he was retiring to Palm Springs, and he was inviting all the local DJs to come over and take his records. He didn't want to bring them to Palm Springs. So we were the, the last, the new kids on the block, so he invited us over last, and there were two crates of tapes. And uh, Ken, who is here actually today, um, was there and saw the tapes and was like, we're gonna take the tapes. and. Two of the tapes had Patrick's handwriting and had song titles. I brought one of them today to show you. This is one of the, the tapes that Ken actually had transferred because it said Patrick Cowley and had all these song titles that we were not familiar with. And on the bottom it says, music by Patrick Cowley, Maurice Tanny, and Art Adcock. And so I went on Google and looked up Maurice Tanny and found his Facebook and sent a message and said, hey, I found this tape with your name on it. Do you know who Patrick Cowley is? <laughs> I said, what? So yeah, out of the blue, I get this, uh, I get this uh, uh, message from, uh, from Josh. And I, I, 
you know, I'm, I'm a guy kind of uh, saves stuff, and uh, at that point, I hadn't been using tape for about 10 years, but my attic was full of, uh, of old tape, and uh, uh, Josh came over and dug through uh, reel after reel after reel after reel of, uh, of tape, and, um, uh, and, and then I guess you <clears throat> took it over to Fantasy and had the tape baked. The tape uh, uh, deteriorates uh, after a certain amount of time, especially if it's been sitting in someone's attic. Uh, and, uh, but uh, so they uh, take it and they put it into an oven and they raise the temperature up, I don't know, too, like a, not very high, about, about 100 degrees or something, and uh, bake it for a little while. And then one spin on the, uh, on the tape machine and uh, digitize it from there. And who knows what happens to it after that. But, <clears throat> uh, this is uh, uh, really, uh, th this stuff had sat uh, uh, dormant for uh, 30 years or something, and, uh, and uh, it only through uh, Josh's interest in this stuff that is this stuff living again, uh, and, I, and I'll just poke this in right now. Thank you, Josh, for, uh, for uh, uh, showing up the interesting thing, uh, particularly uh, what Patrick was doing at the time, because it was... Uh, it, it, it was it was groundbreaking on, on on some levels. I listen to it now, and and it's I uh, you know I'm filled with all the images of what it was like when we were doing it. But taken in context of the time that uh, this was going on, it was uh, this was on the edge. Uh, and some of it is uh, is pretty cool. Some of it's silly, and uh, some of it is uh, it's all fun though. It's, uh... All right. Well, let's listen to this uh, live concert at CCSF. Patrick, Maurice, and Art. Um, this was this was with uh, Dre Mueller's. I think it was the Electronic Music Lab. Yeah, yeah this was a, like a year-end concert, uh, and I I think if you're going to play what I think you're going to play, uh, this is a, a piece that Patrick had written and that uh, he, he and uh, with some help from Art and I uh, had laid out on uh, on tape, uh, sort of in a, it, using multi-track, and uh, but this was. Taking that thing, like I said, because the, it was so difficult to uh, recreate this stuff with the synthesizers that were so unstable at the time, we did this with the brand new synthesizers that Arthur had, uh, had gotten, which were much more stable. Uh, and so this was, uh, like I think, the only live performance of uh, this piece of music. It's got a lot of you know, sound effects and, uh, and, and stuff in it. It's, uh, it. It was cool. Let's see if this works. That was like taken from the, you know, the tape was, I think, maybe 30 minutes. It was a very long time. Yeah, well, I was, uh, that wasn't the section I was trying to remember, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was uh, some big uh, crescendo that happened there. This, what, what was this? This was like 1974? 73, it's said. 73. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, yeah, so those were the early days. Um, I guess we can move to... Uh, what happened after you, you know, became friends with these two guys and were working at the university, and then you decided to get your own studio? Yeah, this was uh, San Francisco was, I suppose, a, a very different place at the time. It was um, San Francisco was a place that was uh, that most people I knew in San Francisco came from somewhere else, uh, and it was uh, and it was a friendly, easy place to come to. You could live here pretty cheaply. At the time, and uh, and so and and not have to, uh, you know, Pat's basic uh, mo, as was mine at the time, was you know, would uh, work some job for a little while and then uh, quit and coast on that money and do art at the same time. And there was a, it was kind of a magical time in terms of the culture involved. The uh, it it was a. It was a great place to, to come if you were gay. It was a great place to come if you were hippies, and it was a great place to come if you were uh, uh, 
uh, some type of, uh, you know, into particular religions or, uh, or whatever. And, uh, and all those things kind of blended together. The theater scene, the music scene, the, uh, were all uh, uh, in intertwined. And so we, uh, after, uh, I got, I, I'm going to stop this phone from buzzing. It's making me feel good. <laughs> okay. Uh, the um, uh, uh, Patrick uh, was involved in uh, it kind of. Well, I'm going to try to keep this to Patrick uh, as much as possible. Uh, Patrick was the sort of guy that uh, he was very giving. He was very kind. He was very uh, generous with his talent. And when Patrick would see uh, something that was going on that was creative that he thought he could. Uh, add to that he could improve upon whatever was going on uh, he would uh, go there and uh, and contribute his talent and which generally involved the, uh, the, the, the studio and so all this stuff came through the studio uh, with us the uh, theatrical uh, stuff or uh, drag shows or uh, 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 you know, radio things uh, and um, so he was uh, uh, right, and I think you know uh, uh, that it extended to uh, the, uh, he he uh, he didn't particularly like the music in the bathhouses, and so the uh, uh, he created his own music for the bathhouses. Uh, it, it's uh, uh, which is funny because uh, you know a, a lot of the uh, collaboration we did, we, we had this small studio, and it was set up uh, so that initially that uh, the three of us worked together quite a bit, but. Rapidly, it became. Uh, we, we found that we, we uh, paired off. Uh, two of us would work at a time, and then uh, and then we divided up the studio time to. Uh, I, I was like two days, two or three days. Patrick basically had the studio. Two or three days, I had the studio. Art would have the studio. Art, Art was Art's equipment, so he basically had it all the time. And um, so, uh, but we would help each other, and so uh, I, I played on a lot of Patrick's uh, material, but it, it, there was so much happening at the time, often I would play on a track, and I would never hear it again. I'd, I'd just go and do the track, and then it would uh, he'd go and do whatever he was going to do with the thing. And then, uh, and, and that's why it was funny when you came up with that record of, uh, of, uh, of porn music that, uh, that he had done, and I... I, I didn't really think about where any of that, some of that stuff had gone, but uh, so that's where it went in the gay porn. So I, I didn't realize, but I, yes, I have a career in gay porn music, and, so, and I'm quite proud of it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for bringing it to my attention. <laughs> well, I was listening to all these songs and you know the funkier ones. I was like. Patrick didn't really play bass. He didn't, you know, he played drums. He would do synthesized bass, but he wouldn't. He didn't played a little play bit of guitar, too. A little bit of guitar. Generally, the bass two parts. Are. So I was checking with Maurice, since you know most of these tapes, uh, the earlier tapes at least, came from his uh, attic. So let's play one of the songs from the second compilation of uh, porn soundtracks, which is called Muscle Up, and this is a song called Don't Ask that has uh, Maurice on bass. Some of these songs, I, I, you know, I never heard the final versions of it. And when you would play them for me, uh, sometimes I, I barely recognized the track, but I could recognize my own playing. Right. <laughs> All right. Let's see. tapes, I found a demo version of that. Uh, it says August 19th, 1974, which I guess was just the date it was recorded. 
so I'll play that for you too. Very different sounding thing. stuff that kind of preceded uh, the high energy, the, the, the actual hard dance music. Uh, and this was, you can hear all of the, the, the kind of the, the frosting that goes on top of those dance tracks without so much of the, uh, of the you know, the pounding, the pulsating beat uh, underneath it. But the, uh, the, the stuff that Patrick initially did for, uh, by the time he got to Sylvester, uh, it was a lot of this kind of sequencer, swirly, sparkly stuff that happened on top of the uh, of the tracks, which uh, uh, which which is what I hear in here at the time. Besides the fact that they're horrible mixes and uh, bad mastering, <laughs> <laughs> probably no mastering whatsoever. But uh, do you want to talk about short circuit productions? The uh, short, well, yeah, short circuit was a. Uh, you know, we the question became once we finished with uh, with school, what could we do with this stuff? What could we do with these uh, just odd synthesizer noises? And uh, uh, and at the time, uh, we put together a, a little production company called Short Circuit. And our primary uh, the primary thing that we did was the stuff you hear on the radio. You know, uh, and they're called the stingers, and uh, they're, it's that stuff that happens, uh, uh, you know, like r right before the sports report comes on, or right before the, uh, the traffic report, or, uh, or before a you know, DJ. And it's usually something that lasts two, three, five seconds, maybe. Sports, you know. And, and um, so we did a bunch of that stuff, but it was. It, it was attractive to the. We, we worked for KFRC here in San Francisco for uh, for a couple of years, and uh, and the KFRC at the time was the biggest uh, main market station in the country. It had the largest market share of uh, uh, of uh, any station. I, I think at very least west of the Mississippi, and uh, and so they were always looking for something that was sort of cutting edge, uh, that was it sounded space age, you know, up to date. Synthesizer kind of stuff. KFRC. KFRC. <laughs> right. Uh, we, we we did a lot of that stuff and and uh, and, and some commercials and uh, other things when. Uh, uh, so yeah, Patrick was uh, Patrick Art and I did, did a lot of that stuff. Yeah, even, I mean, even on this reel I have it says on the bottom copyright 1976 short circuit productions. So when I was going through all the tapes in Maurice's attic, I found this um, jingle that they did, like kind of a promo to kind of sell short circuit productions. Well, this if you is wanted going to be embarrassing as well. You might recognize the voice. I'm here for the embarrassment. Everyone knows in a commercial format you need something to grab the listener's attention. What short circuit is offering is not only high quality material at a very reasonable price, but something a little different something newer, more up-to-date with the music and listeners of today. We're offering all stations, from the largest budget to the small and medium-sized stations who can't afford a comparable $4,000 package. Quality, quantity, and that taste of the unique that will set your station apart from the competition with their old-style material that has remained unchanged for years. Now, we're not here to tell you that we're going to make you the number one in your market. You have to be good yourself. But progressive material will definitely go a long way in placing you ahead of your competitors. But rather than describe the material any farther, let's listen to the parts of the package. This is our station ID logo. Notice its bright, sparkling, yet punchy sound. Okay, I think we have a point there. Yay, station logo! Yay, station logo! That's the first time I've ever heard a station logo applauded. <laughs> you are special. <laughs> well, I, I feel like a lot of people don't know that Patrick, you know, this was his field. This is kind of how his entryway into 
you know, the music production. He was, you know, they were doing this to make some money and to kind of keep up to date with, you know, the sounds. And this was kind of part of his story. So we um, at, at the time uh, of, of, the, of the three of us, uh, uh, Patrick did a lot of, uh, like I said, you know, theatrical uh, uh, projects and stuff, stuff that we could do in the studio. Uh, and send out a tape and they would use it, you know, in a theater or whatever it, it, was, it was going to be. I, uh, of the three of us, I was the only one that was uh, actually working as a musician out in bands at the time. <clears throat> and I was uh, uh, constantly uh, trying to pull Patrick into that world. Uh, uh, Patrick, besides being, uh, you know, uh, really uh, uh, talented with uh, synthesizers and with... Uh, and with just sort of general creativity, he played drums as well. And uh, and so I was, I would bring him into uh, you know uh, whatever kind of band situation that I could, just so we could make some money. And the uh, and so we played in some show bands and uh, and we did a, I brought him into this show band. Uh, oh, I, can't I actually have it right here. The Steve Jordan band. That's it. That's what, it, it was a DJ at the time, uh, and he had a, a show band that was playing at the uh, at the city uh, down in uh, North Beach, and uh, we, we needed a drummer. And I got Patrick uh, twisted his arm uh, to, to come and play uh, at, on these shows. And uh, Candice uh, uh, Vidala. Uh, yes. Candida, uh, Candida Royale, Candida Royale, our, 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 our local porn star, uh, was was part of that, and, and some other people, and we worked the show at uh, at the city in the showroom because they had a big discotheque on one floor and a showroom on the other, and uh, and that's uh, Patrick uh, uh, was listening to the music upstairs the uh, in the disco, and typical of Patrick, he thought he could do it better. <laughs> and uh, so he uh, he made up some uh, uh, some reels of tape and brought them up to the DJ that was uh, uh, upstairs spinning and uh, and the guy really liked it and uh, and they started playing Patrick's stuff uh, at, at the uh, in the di disco upstairs and Patrick was doing stuff that was uh, I, I think it was, they referred to it as top of the night uh, uh, disco it was a uh, high energy. Uh, stuff that uh, they would play uh, uh, further on through the night and as uh, sort of a peak of the evening. And uh, and that's how he met Sylvester. Sylvester was there uh, at the club one night and this music comes on and, uh, and he turned to his manager, Harvey Pacoa, something like that, and said, that's what I want. I want this on my record. And it was basically, you know, uh, and uh, Boomsa style disco, four on the floor. And uh, and that's uh, and that's how they made the connection with uh, uh, with Sylvester and Patrick. Yeah, that was in North Beach at the City uh, Disco, where he was like actually got a job doing the lights. Um, right. <laughs> and uh, what we do for money. Yes, and we only learned this because of the journal that we found uh, that was given to Teresa uh, McGinley, who used to live here and is now in uh, North Carolina. And she took care of Patrick until his dying day. Uh, he gave her his journal, which we published a few years ago. Um, and inside the journal, Patrick talks about playing you know, with Maurice uh, at the city and then getting a job, uh, running the lights at the city, and then talking about seeing Sylvester perform live and then he talks about like joining Sylvester's band so the journal is out there if you want to read you know kind of snippets of this story from Patrick's um some saucy thing. stuff in there too yeah there's a lot of saucy stuff. <laughs> yeah actually this is actually the real journal um so this is like what we transcribed nothing was edited it's completely all intact, no names were changed, sorry. <laughs> sorry for all the lovers that you know, he called out for getting you know, uh, SDEs from and stuff. But, uh, <laughs> that was real. You know, this was an era where there wasn't really anything you could catch that couldn't be cured with a shot in the butt. It's true. Uh, so, it's all right. And uh, I guess, yeah, I was gonna play also another song that Maurice plays on that kind of documented Patrick's time uh, in, Soma in the bathhouses called Beef of Love. Huh? 
Uh, I haven't heard this in a while. Yeah. Hypnotic uh, sort of stuff, which it was really new at this time. You, you, uh, this hadn't really come out in a, a commercial sense so much. Of that, but, uh, and this, uh, this, and all uh, the other pieces like it were, were done uh, in all the layers. There were, these weren't created with a with a band all playing together at the same time. Patrick would start with uh, with a cowbell or uh, with a tambourine or something. He generally laid down uh, some type of percussion track, and then uh, by the time I would get to it, uh, there would already be this kind of basic uh, rhythm that was going on, and, he, and then I'd just play on top of it, and as I said, I often would never hear it again. And, uh, and, and so by the time uh, you brought it back, he had layered all those other stuff on top of it, and. Uh, it's barely recognizable to me, other than the fact that I know that's me playing. <laughs> uh, 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 but all the other stuff that's on top of it, uh, it was all done, and this is when we had four track machines. Uh, he would, it's all done by filling up three tracks or four tracks and then bouncing it to a two track machine, taking the two track reel, putting it back on the four track, filling the other two tracks up with more stuff, bouncing it again, and it's a repeated process that you can't go back with it. It's a it's a destructive process where you can't uh, if you you can't change anything that was already back there in those original tracks. So Patrick had would make decisions or uh, or just live with the decisions that had been made at the time, and he would um, and yeah. So it, this is uh, it, would, it might take him all day to do uh, you know four minutes worth of uh, uh, of music there and. Uh, and we'd be in the other room listening to this the entire day. Uh, but, uh, what is this? <laughs> this is from the same session. It's about 1978, 79, so it's a little later. This but is a little bit like eight tracks. Yeah. It was generally the, the, the kind of pop music that uh, you'd hear on, you know, on any top forty radio station. They'd be playing Elton John or you know whatever, and then, which uh, at, at this point doesn't seem like the as erotic as it might uh, <laughs> as, as perhaps it could have been. And, and of course, it, so hence Patrick uh, thought he could do this better. And this stuff, I, I, you know, I it, it's not something I, I you know listen to. Uh, concentrating just on it, it's it's kind of it's background music, uh, intended as background music for the events that were going on in, <laughs> in the bathhouse and the barracks or the, the kinds of. Uh, the, it was a different place uh, at the time. So. Yeah, so I mean, I think there's a line between you know Patrick going to the bathhouses frequently in Soma. You know, once the studio had moved to the Soma district, his. It was right outside was, you know, there's a bathhouse on every corner, you know, people were saying if you knew a gay carpenter, you could just make your bathhouse and they would have bathhouse openings every week. There were, you know, dozens and... When uh, we, had, uh, we had initially had the studio out by City College in a, in a really funky house that uh, we had rented out there. 
when uh, when we moved it, we had a choices of a, of a number of places, and we looked at industrial spaces and stuff around the city. And uh, uh, when we settled on the studio at Eighth and Minna Street, Patrick was in heaven. <laughs> it, was, uh, it really uh, we we could not have possibly found a better uh, location for uh, for Patrick. He was. Uh, Hanging out in front of the studio is like a hay sailor. Right? So, it was, it was, yeah, it was. <laughs> that, that was a great location. <laughs> yeah. And so when he was contacted by John Coletti, who was the director um, of porn in Los Angeles, uh, to you know score these uh, silent eight, well, sixteen millimeter films that were sold on eight millimeter loops without you know. Um, they didn't want to overdub the sex, you know, noises and have, there was no plot. So he was contacted by uh, this uh, director. And so he was giving, you know, now that we have a whole list of Patrick's chronological songs, we know that he was pulling from these tapes that he was you know, doing in college, even in 74 with Maurice, like, don't ask. And then he was also composing new music that sounded more like this, uh, kind of like, you know, slow-mo psychedelic stuff uh, for the soundtracks. I brought the VHS tape uh, to show everyone to say the, the very first, uh, the actual VHS tape that, um, <laughs> for the school days that started it all for uh, Patrick and- uh, Ooh, VHS? VHS. <laughs> <laughs> and these, yeah, these were really expensive when they first came out and uh, it just changed everything because you could then, you had an audio track. So this is why um, Patrick was contacted. So. Yay, uh, school days. School days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's it. Uh, I guess we can also talk about um, Patrick's uh, record label that he started soon after working with Sylvester. He got a lot of money for uh, Mighty Real. Yeah. It went to number one. He bought a house yeah. in the Castro with the money. It's kind of remarkable how cheap houses were. Yeah. Money, so <laughs> and how much money you used to make off selling, you know, if you sold a million records, you made a lot of money. <laughs> it's, it's true. Now it's not the case. So. <laughs> yeah, so he got a. Uh, yeah, after Mighty Real, he, uh, he, he got a burst of cash, bought, uh, bought a house, and, uh, and an identical. Uh, studio setup to what we had been uh, using, so that he, so that rather than you know being restricted to you know two or three days uh, in the in the studio, he now had his own studio and uh, and could work twenty four seven. You know, and he was really sort of cranking the stuff out at that point. And so, uh, and so he got a a, a partner, uh, uh, Marty Blackman, and they uh, they formed they formed Megaton. Which um, and, and did the first the first record was uh, of Megatron Man, right? Yeah, I'll play some of that because Maurice also plays bass. On yeah, that song too. We had started working with drum machines, which were uh, you know a huge step up from uh, what we had been doing. And like I said, the, the, a lot of those uh, tracks you were hearing earlier were, were done uh, with uh, Patrick uh, laying out these uh, rhythm tracks all by hand. Uh, with the drum machines, we uh, now we had eight track machines, and one track would be used as a uh, for a sync code, a synthy sync code, which would go out to a box which would generate MIDI, which would run a drum machine. And with the drum machine, it had, 
you know, eight individual outs uh, on it. And so you could control uh, uh, the, the snare and the hi-hat and the, the toms, and, uh, and it never even hit the tape. It, it would just go straight into the mixer. So it gave us a, a tremendous amount of uh, flexibility. And, uh, and so this uh, material started to sound more like songs, but it still was working with this long form extended disco uh, uh, mixes. That, uh, and as long as these songs were, uh, you know, some of them would be, you know, six, eight minutes, uh, uh, we, we'd give them to uh, uh, Marty, uh, and he would find a DJ uh, in one place or another, and, uh, and he would give them a track that was already like six minutes long, and the guy would take it, cut it up, and back in the 60s, they used to take your songs and cut your three-minute song down to two minutes so it would go on the air. These guys would take your six-minute song and turn it into a 12-minute song, and, or discos, right? And, and it kind of... Um, so I, I guess so the DJ didn't have to change the records quite so often. They, uh, but they would uh, stretch these things out. And just listening to them by themselves, it's like it's going on and on and on. But on the dance floor, it builds this... Uh, you guys ever go to dance floors? <laughs> it, uh, it, it just sort of builds this tension. And it's, it, whereas uh, previously, the DJs would have to do what they could kind of manually by uh, mixing together two copies of the same song or uh, you know, various things they would do in order to get it to, to stretch the stuff out, to get the moment uh, when everybody was going to do the poppers or whatever. Uh, <laughs> they, uh, so yeah, uh, that, uh, that Megatron mix uh, that was on the uh, Megatron Man mix that's on the record. I think there are other ones around that... Uh, They're like 10 minutes long. 10 minutes long, yeah. It's, uh, that's and good music. Course, everyone knows, you know, Patrick, his 16-minute version of uh, I Feel Love by Donna Summer. That was very early. That was early. Very yeah, early. Was, uh, and it was rejected by Casablanca, and then right before he passed away, they decided to release it. Um, and so that also was, yeah, very, you know, he was he was kind of doing all that splicing and cutting and inserting. It's a typical stuff. Patrick, you know. Yeah. He heard something he liked, thought he could do it better, <laughs> and, uh, add to it, and uh, and you know they didn't pay him to do that. He uh, he just thought this is the way I hear it. He did it and sent it off, and you know whether they took it or not was uh, really up to them. But that was uh, typical of Patrick with his uh, his combination of talent and generosity that uh, he. And, you know, he did this for all kinds of people, for all kinds of projects that uh, didn't necessarily, you know, garner any interest or whatever. It was all done purely for the art of it. And uh, yeah. I salute you. It's beautiful. Well, that's probably a good, a good place to end. Okay. Uh, <laughs> We're going to open up the floor if anyone has any questions for Maurice. Um, Please, don't be shy. <laughs> um, can I say something? Um, talking about uh, Packet's version of uh, I feel, you know, uh, of, of Donna Summer, I play it all the time. <laughs> so I, I get it. <laughs> so thank you. Well, I, I, I th once again, thank you, Josh, for uh, for uh, keeping all this stuff uh, rolling and, and alive. Uh, you know, it would have uh, it, it would have languished in uh, John Hedges' basement or my attic. And uh, because, uh, but you know, I don't don't get rid of anything because you, know, you never know when somebody like this is going to come along and see the merit in it. Uh, it's, it's interesting, it kind of in a historical perspective. I I, I kind of see this material as. Uh, uh, as a, as a marker of, of what San Francisco was in, in the in the 70s, and it was a, it was it was a magical time, magical place, uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for doing this. Thank you, Tender One Museum, for uh, for putting this on. I'm gonna have you uh, If there's any questions, I'm over here. I can bring you a microphone so everybody can hear you ask your question. Questions? What could the audience? Nobody has any of them. I don't have a question. I have more of an observation, and I've said this before in public, so some of you may have heard it already. Um, I came to the Bay Area in 1978 when I went to college, and I would travel up the peninsula on weekends and visit the bathhouses. 
and I would hear Patrick Kelly's music playing in the bathhouses. And you'd hear that music, you'd, you'd walk down the hallway more sexily, <laughs> posed against the wall more sexily. <clears throat> At the risk of TMI, you would do it more sexily. <laughs> and he was right, the, the music that all you produced was perfect for the ambiance and just the feeling. It was just perfect. It was a soundtrack. It was a soundtrack to to your life. When I think of when I hear his music, I think of those days. I was a kid. I thought that way of life would last forever. I had no perspective. And in 18, uh, 1984, when Diane Feinstein closed the bathhouses, I go, wait, I just got here. You can't go just yet. Um, so thank you for your contribution to that music. When I hear it, I just think of a particular moment in my life. I was at the tail end, but I'm so grateful I had at least those moments that younger people don't understand what it was like. So thank you very much. Uh, it's a, you know, thank you, San Francisco, for, for making this uh, a, a place that all this could happen in. Uh, this what this wasn't going to happen in St. Louis. It wasn't going to happen in uh, in just about anywhere else. But San Francisco was a place at the time that was uh, was welcoming and open-minded, and uh, and th those uh, th those people, those places, uh, could all exist here and flourish. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm I'm glad you're still here with us. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, um, I was curious a little about Patrick's process sequencing the synthesizers. Would, was he the kind of person that would methodically get a sequence ready and then record it, or were you guys just like recording stuff and getting it to tape as fast as you could and just moving on? Um, uh, Patrick worked pretty fast, yeah. uh, it, and um, and the, the kind of the nature of uh, of the uh, equipment we had and. Uh, we, Patrick uh, didn't drive. Patrick uh, took the bus everywhere, and uh, Patrick would be uh, uh, would show up at the house, uh, and he, he heard some snippet of uh, of music uh, along the way. He'd have it in his head, uh, and it was his day. And he we'd hear him come in. And he'd uh, sit down and start working with this little thing he had had in his head, and uh, and often. Um, he wasn't. He wasn't a, a, a trained school musician. You know, he was going to write down uh, uh, music. So, uh, you know, it was uh, it was the little piece that he remembered uh, of, of what it was. And uh, so, uh, I, I kind of equate it to uh, like musical mondegreens. You know, how you hear somebody say something, but you didn't hear it right. And uh, and this is the same sort of thing. He would hear some piece of music. It's a little snippet of melody or rhythm or whatever, it, and he couldn't quite get it right, but it turned into something that was his own, and so he would uh, lay it out, and it would happen happen very quickly, and stuff would get piled on it, each layer a reaction to the previous layer, and I hope I'm answering it. it, it yeah, would, yeah, definitely. Yeah, uh, it, it's Thank you. A very little of it was uh, it, um, uh, was it planned out from the beginning to know where it was going to go in the end. Each thing is sort of a, uh, a little journey onto its own, especially those uh, earlier ones that uh, are sort of hypnotic uh, uh, things that are tracks piled on top of each other. Uh, because of the limitations of the equipment uh, that we had, and, uh, and the, the, and a lot of equipment kind of came in and out. People would loan us stuff, and so we would be learning these pieces of gear at the time, and uh, other pieces of gear that would just had just come out, and we weren't, we were uh, really kind of on the same cutting edge as the people who designed these things, like early digital sequencers, all that kind of swirly uh, synthesizers, that that kind of stuff you would hear uh, that came like an Oberheim sequencer that came out. Uh, we got the thing practically the, when the first ones came out, and we were experimenting with them just as the people who were making this stuff. So it, it was uh, uh, kind of trial and error. And so, and Patrick was very much an intuitive uh, sort of guy. That uh, Arthur was the guy who you know, owned a lot of the gear. He was the more uh, he was more likely to read the manuals. 
and uh, uh, understand exactly what was going on. But Patrick, I, Patrick never read a manual. Uh, Pat, Patrick would uh, would go in there, turn the thing on, start twisting knobs, and but you know this is a matter of taste, right? Uh, he would find uh, you could trust him to find something that was going to work, and then he'd use that, and then he'd find something else that was going to work. Arthur would help him often uh, with since he knew the gear so well, he could help him find stuff. But this was all uh, a matter of, uh, of of Patrick's taste, and if uh, if he didn't have such good taste, there would have been just a mess. But uh, he would just pile stuff on top, and uh, and you'd get uh, where he got. Yeah, there are some like some and we have, we found another one of his notebooks and in there there were like all synth settings with dials like I guess we could remember where he left the synth the last night or the drum yeah machine. trying to so get back to it there would just be pages of all these you know where the dials are and um, even some of the synths that we've seen photos of that are now in England with uh, Ian Anthony Stevens there's still a chalk mark on like the dials where Patrick had left the last setting or you know was trying to I guess you know remember where things were set. Yeah, it was, uh, and it was, that was still really kind of uh, 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 iffy uh, because the, the, especially the earliest stuff, like I said, it was so unstable. You could set all the knobs in exactly the same place and you wouldn't get exactly the same uh, thing back. As a matter of fact, you could leave those knobs there, turn the machine off. When you come back and turn it on, as the thing heated up, it would be different. Uh, so it's, uh, but yeah, the equipment got better and, uh, and really, uh, uh, for me, the, uh, one of the things about electronic music early on was that it was very much uh, a process that, uh, you know, I was talking about the blip and the squeak, uh, they were made by uh, controlling all these modules that a synthesizer would have. And in order to create a sound, uh, you started with uh, a module that made a tone. You needed... A, if you wanted that tone to stop, you had to send it through another module that would be an amplifier. And with that amplifier, it, it kind of counterintuitively, you could turn the sound off. And then if you wanted it to, to turn off gradually, you would use an envelope generator to control this amplifier. So with or maybe it would come on slowly. And if you wanted to change the timbre of it, you'd run it through uh, a, a, a filter. So it would go wow. And it, it, how fast you want it to do that, you need. So you needed a module for every aspect of every sound that you made. And Patrick was working in this environment where any given, all those kind of uh, sounds, those, each each mock was uh, had to be put together with these synthesizer modules, and Patrick didn't always understand <clears throat> exactly what every one of these modules or what every knob on one of these modules did. But he had taste. He would fill with it until he found the thing that he liked that, that turned him on, and he would use that. Later on, uh, synthesizers became programmable, and they became polyphonic. Uh, early on, uh, th these you would make one sound at a time, and you really. I equate it to uh, it, it's just imagine if you wanted to speak, but you had to think about every muscle you were going to use, and you first you filled your lungs with air, and then you let it out slowly, and you tensed your vocal cords, and uh, to get them to vibrate, and then as the sound passed through your mouth, you operated your lips and your tongue, uh, you know, very, uh, you had to think about how, what you were going to do with your lips and tongue. And imagine every sound you made, you had to think out the process like this. Well, that was what every one of those sounds early on with the synthesizer was like. And so everything became very uh, premeditated in not so much in the, what, the way it came out, but you had to think about this stuff. Every sound was very uh, distinct and deliberate, that's the word I'm looking for. Uh, at a certain point, uh, the synthesizers became programmable and you could, all those all those diagrams he was making, marking stuff, you no longer needed to do that. The, the, stable, uh, the synthesizer was stable, you could get right back to the same thing. And, uh, and it sort of took some of the fun out of it uh, because it became 
cheaper in a way. It was less labor involved uh, with it. And then they became polyphonic. And you could do all those things. Instead, Patrick, every one of those things, if you heard a harmony in it, he had to play two tracks with it. And everything that, uh, that happened polyphonically, he had to play at each part individually. Then it, we got polyphonic synthesizers, and the synthesizer became like another keyboard. It was just like an organ or anything else. And the, the sounds, the nature of, uh, of uh, electronic music changed quite a bit there. Uh, that was probably by about 1981, 82. And uh, the, the character of electronic music uh, became uh, different. It became integrated into the sort of regular pop music and uh, it, it didn't have the kind of special uh, deliberate quality that, uh, that the Patrick stuff or, you know, the other artists that were doing stuff at the time that uh, like, uh, well, you know, I mean, we can talk about Giorgio Moroder or somebody like that in the dance music, but there were other artists like uh, Isao Tomita, who was doing uh, classical music with uh, synthesizers, and uh, but you know, each one of each one of those sounds is so carefully crafted, and that's the, kind of the part of the charm of, uh, what, of what Patrick was doing early on is because it was difficult. It took a lot of work to do not just the music, but to create the sounds to make the music with. So um, it was it was a different time for. Uh, uh, for music technology, I think, and um, and that shows in, uh, in in the work of the time. I don't think we'll get back to that because it's like, it's like the genes out of the bottle at this point. Can I ask you? You were referring to an artist um, like a couple of sentences ago. Um, I I didn't catch the name. Uh, well, I mentioned two. One was Giorgio Moroder, the Tomita. dance guy, and the other yeah. one uh, that I was Isao Tomita. Tomita is a Japanese uh, okay. a synthesizer cool. guy. Uh, I, check out his uh, uh, his WC album, The Snowflakes Are Dancing. Or he also did uh, 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 Firebird, I, I think. They're Thank you. Gore, absolutely gorgeous uh, uh, recordings, all done with synthesizers. This is just post Switched On Bach. And switched on Bach was uh, 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 Wendy Carlos's uh, uh, version of uh, mostly Bach uh, quartet chorales, and that uh, were done all with uh, with Moogs. And that was you know you see the pictures of what, him at the time uh, with th this massive uh, synthesizer setup uh, and with just dozens and dozens of these modules to create each one of those sounds and uh, in order to do these uh, Bach pieces. And, uh, Maybe one more question. Who's him, of course. Right. And here you have an answer. Um, were there any geographical places in San Francisco or like geological like, like weather events or anything that were like natural things that inspired Patrick about the San Francisco Bay Area? Great question. Mm, uh, well, you know, I mean, uh, the, 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 you know, he, he did a lot of stuff. I mean, I, mean, I, I would. I would naturally gravitate towards the you know the kind of theaters and stuff that uh, that he worked with uh, the 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 like the Cockettes or uh, uh, what was the, the 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 show he did that had Divine in it that was um, uh, oh, Heartbreak of Psoriasis. Heartbreak of Psoriasis. <laughs> <laughs> I want it all. Uh, uh, that's that those were done uh, down in uh, North Beach, yes. uh, right and. Uh, and then, you know, of course, the, the, the bathhouses, the actual uh, uh, the buildings, uh, most of them I don't think are even there at this point. Oh, the barracks burned down. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> but the, um, uh, the Jaguar bookstore. <laughs> uh, uh, the other, uh, I guess the locations, I mean, it, our, uh, our initial studio was, uh, was, was out on Plymouth Street in the Ingleside. Uh, and that was a funky house. I think that it's probably been torn down and something else put up in its place. And the uh, uh, Patrick's house on uh, on uh, 17th Street, and uh, and then another one on Collins. No, it was uh, Corbin. Corbin. And uh, the and, and our main studio was was at Eighth and Minna, which is uh, still there, uh, that brick building. That's uh, although I think it's been uh, bought and gutted on the inside. That was a cool. Uh, studio. We had we shared it with a with a Chinese laundry on one side, and uh, and we were loud. Uh, <laughs> that, that that building was just pounding all the time. And 
uh, and so Patrick had uh, one side and Art and I had the other side of the ground floor, which was right next to the cleaners. And upstairs we uh, had, we rented space to uh, a couple of other uh, megatone artists, Jolo, uh, uh, they had a, a space up there and, and there was another, uh, uh, yeah, and another band, uh, Jorge Siracas uh, had a, a, a band up, up there, and the whole place was just, and we couldn't have had a more ideal neighbor than the, uh, than the Chinese lunches. They had uh, a, a compressor that was in the back that was so loud, they couldn't hear any of us, or either that, they just didn't care, it was perfect. <laughs> uh, yeah, it would, be, it would be like, you know, living next door to, you know, studio instrument rentals or one of those, uh, there were districts in, in South of Market that were really music districts at the time. There was that space down on, uh, you, you cut me off whenever you're ready here. This is a, uh, there was that, that space down around 4th and Folsom. Uh, uh, I, I, think, I think it was 4th and Folsom, or 4th and Bryant, uh, where uh, on one side of the street, there was CBS recording, which became the Automat, and on the other side was studio instrument rentals where everybody, all the big touring acts, would rehearse and rent their gear from. And next to that was uh, uh, Stars Guitars, uh, the same guys who built instruments for the Grateful Dead. And, uh, and it was just a, it was a bunch of little businesses all right there in this one little block area, all of it gone now. But it was, uh, but you could, you'd be in any one of those shops and uh, you just don't know who you'd run into at the time. It was, uh, uh, yeah, it was an exciting time. That was that was the, uh, the era Patrick was of the uh, uh, areas. I, I guess that uh, would probably be the most. Uh, I'm trying to remember the ice cream shop you worked at. Oh, uh, that was Gaylord's. <laughs> Gaylord's. <laughs> he scooped ice cream at Gaylord's ice cream. <laughs> Too fitting. Uh, I think that was in. Oh gosh, I think it was in the Mission actually. Gaylords? Yeah. Was it on, on church? Oh, uh, church or market? Yeah. Church, something like that, yeah. yeah it was I might have, no, I'm not, not mixing it up with me. I think, yeah, maybe it was a chain. Um, he lived in the Castro up until he passed away, so he was kind of, once he got some money, he left the, you know, the other neighborhoods he was in and bought a house in the Castro, which also was where Sylvester lived right at the time. Right, Marty, uh, and Marty, Marty Black, Black, yeah, Megatone yeah, yeah. Records is actually now Strut, where everyone goes to get their tests. That, where you get your tests is literally Megatone Records. <laughs> same office where you get all your blood drawn, that's literally where Megatone Records offices were. It's the same exact floor and building. Good times. So, yeah, little bit of freedom. Well, yeah. I think that was a really wonderful final question. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly because I've Thank you for asking it, because I feel like uh, a lot of what we think about here at the museum is the relationship between people and place, specifically the Tenderloin, but uh, in general as well. And uh, yeah, this music is extremely like of its time in a way, but also kind of timeless, and that intersection is one that we like to look closely at. Uh, thank you both so much for uh, sharing uh, sharing these stories. It's really cool to, to kind of get into the details of how the music was made a little overview of synthesis, uh, early synthesis, uh, which is something that has deep roots here in the Bay. I mean, whether it's San Francisco Tape Center, Buchla, like also just Mills College, Mills College uh, and going back to like Henry Cowell, people, composers, musicians that were really envisioning like a new way of articulating sound. And Patrick was someone that, that did that. Uh, and yeah, we're, 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 um, Josh, thank you so much for so for doing such careful, diligent work, uh, archival work, really to to bring this musician's uh, you know body of work and his legacy into clear focus uh, and make it available to a, a new generation of musicians. Maurice, thank you for sharing such great stories uh, about your collaborations and about yeah San Francisco of the seventies and eighties, which was I. Yeah. Before my time, but uh, a very different city. <laughs> oh, you kids! Uh, it's a very long haul to take for forty plus years. <laughs> Fifty years. Thank you. Uh, thank you to our audience for being here tonight. Uh, if you have liked this, uh, definitely 
keep in touch, uh, sign up for our email newsletter, follow us on the social media. We do a public program most weeks here, typically on Thursdays. Uh, next Thursday, we'll be screening uh, Home is a Hotel, uh, which is a new documentary that premiered at SF Film uh, earlier this year. It's about uh, life in residential hotels in San Francisco, including uh, yes, yeah, portraits of people here in the Tenderloin that we know very well, our friends and we work with regularly. Uh, and as Katie mentioned earlier, uh, we have a, a new neon sign, and there will be a sign lighting ceremony on Wednesday, November 8th, after the time changes and it gets darker early, so we can bask in its full radiant glory for longer. Um, and uh, Dark Entries is selling some merch at the front desk, in case you haven't seen it, and maybe uh, two sort of Dark Entries related uh, things to mention. One, this would be Patrick Cowley's 73rd birthday. Today is his birthday, so happy birthday. <laughs> And uh, was it yesterday or Tuesday you released a book? Yes. I, yeah, I was in a book club today. I didn't have to, we mentioned Jorge okay. Socars a few times, and his name is also on this. It's really real. Um, but Patrick and Jorge, ah. they were lovers. They uh, briefly, and they were more importantly, they were, uh, they collaborated a lot um, from 75 to 81. Uh, Jorge was the front man for Indoor Life, uh, this post-punk band, kind of art rock band that Patrick produced and played synthesizer on. And Jorge was kind of the connection to all of this because basically when, when Ken grabbed this tape and we found this tape that said Jorge Socaris on it, we... And they were the cutest couple first. ever. <laughs> they, were, they were both so pretty. It was... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, young and in love. They were 25. They were, yeah, they were kids. And uh, well, Jorge, on that note, he I just published a book of all of his gay love poems. Uh, definitely, there's some Patrick in here, and there's beautiful illustrations by uh, Mel Odom, who did drawings for Blue Boy and Drummer and uh, you know all the great 80s, 70s, 80s uh, gay magazines. So yeah, this just came out and. You can buy it at the desk from. Uh, so, two questions. Uh, two questions. Uh, oh, uh, 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 school days. And who's the DJ that to the yeah. DJ now? Uh, well, school days like the cinema? <laughs> uh, maybe Josh can answer that, that question. Uh, the DJ uh, present is Steve Davis. Yeah. We're going to enjoy the set by DJ Steve Davis. Uh, momentarily, uh, so grateful to have a full house tonight. And uh, when I put this microphone down, I and some of my colleagues might uh, hurry some of you folks away on the uh, stage right here so we can clear these chairs and make some room to like dance. I feel, I feel so inclined. Uh, thank you, Josh. Thank you, Maurice. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve.